And now it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Mike Vincent. Hello and thank you for watching part two of our look at the Lord of the Rings, the living card game, core set, player cards. Uh, last time we took a look at the tactic sphere. Um, and today we're going to take a look at the leadership sphere. So the tactic sphere, which we talked about before, was very strong at combat. Uh, they are very good at attacking and defending, and a lot of their cards revolved around boosting attack, boosting defense, um, or dealing direct damage. Now the leadership sphere, um, they are especially proficient at giving extra resources. So you're going to notice there's a lot of cards that have to do with giving you more resources to spend on other cards. And there's also quite a bit of cards that give you readying effects. So they're going to make your allies and your heroes um, available to do extra things in a turn. So without further ado, let's take a look at the heroes for the leadership sphere. Okay, so you'll notice that the uh, Memoir 44 card stands, I decided to retire. And I'm just going to take a look at the cards with a nice black background. So hopefully that works for everyone. Uh, the first hero we're going to take a look at is Aragorn. Um, obviously a very popular figure from the books and the movies. He has 12 starting threat, 2 willpower, 3 attack, 2 defense, and a whopping 5 hit points. Um, he is a Dunedain, he is a noble, and he is a ranger. And his abilities read Sentinel. After Aragorn commits to a quest, spend one resource from his resource pool to ready him. So the Sentinel keyword, if you don't know, allows Aragorn to defend an attack that is directed towards uh, the player you are with. So he is very uh, useful in that if he's available, you are able to block if your partner is overwhelmed with an attack. Um, and I think the word for Aragorn in this case is versatility. Uh, he has two willpower, he has three attack and two defense. So his stats are well-rounded. And because of his special ability, and because leadership is especially good at generating resources, there's going to be a good chance that Aragorn's going to be able to do multiple things in one turn. So there are cards which we'll look at later, which will boost his willpower um, so that he can quest every turn. But then if you can pay a resource, you can then ready him and use him for either attacking or defending. So with three attack, it makes him a very good attacker. And with two defense and perhaps a little bit of stat boosting, he could also be a very solid defender especially given that he has five hit points. So Aragorn, in my opinion, is a very good hero. Um, 12 starting threat is a bit high, but his abilities make it worth it, in my opinion. So there we have Aragorn. So here we see Theodrid. Uh, he has eight starting threat, one willpower, two attack, one defense, and four hit points. He is a noble, he is Rohan, and he is a warrior. His card reads response. After Theodrid commits to a quest, choose a hero committed to that quest. Add one resource to that hero's resource pool. So having just looked at Aragorn, you've probably already made the connection that Theodred is a perfect match to go with Aragorn. So when you commit Theodred to the quest, he will then give one resource to Aragorn, and you can then spend that resource for Aragorn to ready him if you need to attack or defend. Now if you don't, you just have an extra resource to pay for a card next turn, but this allows Aragorn to quest every turn, and then to then attack or defend if you need him to do so. So Theodred, his stats are pretty underwhelming otherwise. Um, yes, an eight starting threat is pretty low, but he only has one, one, sorry, one willpower and one defense. And I think it's sort of unfortunate that he didn't have one willpower, one more willpower, sorry, given that he will probably be questing every turn. So it's a bit low at one, and I might try to boost this um, using other cards to increase his willpower. But Theodred is a perfect match if you're playing Aragorn. Okay, so here we're going to take a look at Glowin. Um, he has nine starting threat, two willpower, two attack, one defense, and four hit points. His card reads, response, after Glowin suffers damage, add one resource to his resource pool for each point of damage he just suffered. So here we can see an effect sort of similar to Gimli in that you want Glowin to take damage so that you can get resources. Now, he doesn't have quite as many hit points as Gimli, so he only has four. But if you're playing a tactics um, leadership deck, then Glowin could be another possible candidate to receive Citadel Plate. If you can increase his hit points to eight, that means over the course of the game, you'll be able to generate seven extra resources um, without killing him. So Glowin, uh, he's a good hero to bring along if you feel like you're going to need uh, lots of resources in the game. Um, his stats are respectable, um, two willpower, two attack. 
Now it's interesting, his defense is low, which means you're gonna have to be a little careful when you're defending with him, but you will get the resources from him. And if you're playing um, a deck with lore and some healing abilities, well then you can continue to block with Glowin, take damage every turn, and then heal him so that you're always generating resources. And as long as Glowin stays alive, you'll be able to generate a lot of extra resources. So Glowin could work in a leadership tactics deck or a leadership lore deck. Um, depending on how many resources you need to generate. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the allies for the leadership sphere. Now, someone commented last time that they would prefer if I included the amount of cards um, that come in the core set for each card. So I'm happy to do that. Uh, there are three copies of Guard of the Citadel in the core set for leadership. So this ally has two cost, and he has one, pe one willpower, one attack, zero defense and two hit points. He also has the keywords Gondor and Warrior. So I'm not a big fan of the Guard of the Citadel, um, especially when you consider the allies that will come out in the future. To me, this guy kind of screams chump blocker. Um, he's not that great for attacking. He could quest for one willpower, but basically he's got no defense, two hit points. You're probably just gonna use him for cannon fodder at some point. Now he does have a Gondor keyword, and if you stick with this game and buy all the expansions, or at least key expansions, there will be a lot of synergies that will eventually boost the Gondor trait. So this guy will gain more utility later once you have cards that boost um, the Gondor trait. But at this point in the game, um, or when you buy your first couple of expansions, you're probably gonna find that there's better allies than the Guard of the Citadel. He's relatively inexpensive at two cost, but he's really not gonna be doing much other than making, uh, taking a hit or perhaps contributing one willpower to um, quests. So Guard of the Citadel, a bit meh in my opinion. So now taking a look at a much better ally is Faramir. Um, there are two copies of Faramir in the core set and he has four cost, two willpower, one attack, two defense, and three hit points. He also has the Gondor trait. He is a noble and a ranger. His ability reads, action, exhaust Faramir to choose a player. Each character controlled by that player gets plus one willpower to the end of the phase. So Faramir is an excellent card. Um, he's a strong defender with three hit points and two defense, and his special ability can be very useful um, if you need to get a lot of questing done that turn. So as long as you have more than two people committed to the quest, then he is worth playing because he's gonna give more than two willpower then you would use just spending him to quest. And the nice thing about him is you can either choose yourself or your partner, or if you're playing with three or four players, another player uh, to contribute this uh, wisdom to the quest. Sorry, willpower. So Faramir, an excellent ally. Uh, he is quite expensive uh, at four cost, but when you keep in mind leadership, and as we've already mentioned with the heroes, there's lots of ways to generate extra resources with this sphere. And so you're gonna find uh, he is worth the four resources and you're probably not gonna have too much of a problem generating those resources. So Faramir, uh, an excellent ally. So the next ally we're gonna take a look at is the son of Arnor. He has three costs, zero willpower, two attack, zero defense and two hit points. He is a Dunedain and his response reads, after Son of Arnor enters play, choose an enemy card in the staging area or currently engage with another player to engage that enemy. So this is a card that I would not include in my normal decks if I'm not anticipating too much of a problem with a given scenario. However, Son of Arnor is a strategic card that you could put in a deck depending on the encounter that you're working with. So for anyone who's played the Black Riders expansion and played the second quest, The Knife in the Dark, I don't wanna spoil anything for people who haven't played it yet, but you're gonna notice that this card could certainly come in handy for that quest. So his ability to draw an enemy out of the staging area and you can engage with him is certainly a useful ability as there are enemies occasionally who can't be optionally engaged. So he is one tricky way of taking these enemies and being able to engage them and kill them off if you need to. Now he's also handy if you are playing with your partner. If your partner is playing um, primarily a questing willpower deck and they don't have a lot of combat abilities, then playing Son of Arnor might be able to draw, a, um, draw away an enemy from them. So if you have more of a combat strength in your deck, then you can help take care of them. So Son of Arnor is a card that's gonna come in handy in particular situations, but isn't a card that I would just include in most decks, um, unless you're really going for a Dunedain theme. So Son of Arnor, good in the right situation. 
So here we see the Snowborn Scout. Uh, he has one cost, zero willpower, zero attack, one defense, and one hit point. He is Rohan and a scout, and he reads response. After Snowborn Scout enters play, choose a location, place one progress token on that location. So the Snowborn Scout, just by looking at his stats, not very useful. Um, yes, you can use him for chump blocking. Yes, he's a cheap ally. And so he's not a bad ally to include just because he is so cheap and you can use him to defend an attack. And having the ability to place one progress on a location, it has some utility. It's not overly useful, but if you get two or three of these guys out in a game, you, if you consider that's one lo less location in the staging area that you might have to worry about. So not amazing, uh, certainly goes in the chump blocker category, but those are handy to have in some decks, especially if you know there's gonna be lots of enemies. And if you have an enemy with a lot of attack, well, then you can easily just block it with a Snowborn Scout and then do some damage with your other heroes and allies. Okay, so here we have the Silver Load Archer. Uh, he has a cost of three. He has one willpower, two attack, zero defense, and one hit point. He is an archer and sylvan, and he has the keyword ranged. So in the context of when this game came out, the Silver Load Oat Archer, if you're playing leadership, is probably a card you're going to include. Um, he does have a cost of three, which I think is quite expensive given his stats. But to keep in mind, in the leadership sphere, you're going to have extra resources and probably going to be able to pay for this guy. Um, having the keyword ranged can come in handy, and he does have an attack of two, so you can use him for attacking. But I think you're going to find, if you start to buy more expansions, that the Silver Load Archer isn't going to make it, in it into, into your decks. Um, there's certainly a lot better allies out there, and for a cost of three, for this guy, I feel like, it is pretty expensive. Now, he also has the Sylvan keyword, and to be honest, with this game, with all the expansions so far, the Sylvan keyword is not one that has been built for synergies yet. There's not a whole lot of cards that will boost the Sylvan keyword, so perhaps this is a card that will come in handy in the future um, as more expansions come out that work with this keyword. Um, but most of the major um, keywords that have been built up recently, we have lots of synergies for dwarves, quite a few synergies now for Gondor, Recently, lots of Hobbit synergies with the Black Riders, but Sylvan is something still to be developed. So this is a card that for now isn't useful, but in the future uh, could be. And that's one really cool thing about this game is that in some cases, cards when they come out don't appear to have much use, but you notice when other expansions come out and cards come out that will combo with older cards, then suddenly an old card, which you thought was useless, becomes useful. So I think that's one really neat thing about the Lord of the Rings living card game. Anyways, moving on. Okay, here we have Longbeard Orc Slayer. He has four cost, zero willpower, two attack, one defense, and three hit points. He is a dwarf and he is a warrior. Response: After Longbeard Orc Slay, uh, sorry, after Longbeard Orc Slayer enters play, deal one damage to each Orc enemy in play. Um, yeah, this is a good card. Um, I think he's a bit pricey with a cost of four, but again, in the leadership sphere, resources are a little bit easier to come by. Uh, he's good for defense because he has a solid three hit points, and he can do some damage with two attack. Now, of course, if you're playing an encounter where you know you're going to be up against a lot of orcs, you're definitely going to want to include Longbeard Orc Slayer. And the nice thing is, it says each orc enemy in play. So that means if you bring out Longbeard Orc Slayer, he's going to do one damage to any orc in the staging area, engage with your partner, or engage with yourself. So Longbeard Orc Slayer, a really good card, especially if you're going to be playing um, any encounter where you know there's going to be a lot of orc enemies. So there we have the Longbeard Orc Slayer. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. <laughs>